Well, you know it's going to be a serious day of mulching and gardening and re-graveling if I am driving Hub's car instead of my tiny little Fiat Dot because I just went to Lowe's to get a bunch of mulch. And FYI, guys, if you want to know what mulch I use, this is my go to mulch for both the front yard and the backyard when I'm not using gravel. It's Happy Grow Landscaping Mix. It's like a fine pine. It's really, really beautiful. In fact, this bag has a hole in it, so let me just show you its texture. It's really, really beautiful. And I sometimes also use it just as a soil amendment. I'll use it like compost or whatever because it's great for drainage. Now, what I want to talk about on this walkabout today, which is a working walkabout, is looking at your garden from what I'll call a driveway lens or a drive-by lens. So a lot of times when we're pulling into our drive or whatever, if you're like me, um, you always have lots of things on your mind and you're kind of spacing out and you're thinking about all sorts of different things and you're really not paying attention necessarily to what your garden looks like when you drive up or what it would look like to passers-by because we get kind of inured to that because we do it so often. So here's my question of the day. When you drive up into your driveway, do you really pay attention to what the landscape looks like on the approach um, and from both directions? Because it gives you a lot of valuable design insight. So as I was driving with my, uh, with Hub's car filled with mulch and gravel, I noticed that from the west side, driving from the west direction, it really looks unkept and untidy on this approach. From the other approach, not so bad. But let's go this way, Stuart. And the, the light is going to get kind of harsh, but just bear with me. So it looks not too bad from this perspective. But remember that when people are driving by, the first thing they're going to see of my garden is this vantage point right here. Now it doesn't look too bad because the soil is damp, the soil is moist, and so it looks more lush than it does normally. But that's because I just watered. When this is dry, when it's been windy, uh, it really looks unkept and kind of messy. And so I noticed that as I drove up. So that's my first design tip, I guess, for this walkabout, is make sure that you look at the approach, how it appears to cars as they drive up and, uh, and definitely from both directions. Okay, so now let's go back here. So here is something that I'm gonna be doing. And I'm going to start here because I want to show you how I'm going to remedy, I think, some of that messiness. And of course, as always, what I need to do, I didn't get out here early enough, is in full sun. But this will give you an idea. So I asked you guys a while back if you like, okay, perfect timing, if you like Verbena bernariensis. And whether you do or you don't, it is definitely a pollinator magnet. Now, all of this that has gone to seed in here, see all the tiny little moths? There's one, Stuart. There's a butterfly over there. So all of these have gone to seed in this space. It can be a little bit too rapacious. It can really self-seed a little bit too aggressively. And at this stage in its bloom, I think it starts looking a little bit messy. Now I have, I have let it remain at this stage in its life cycle for as long as possible because obviously I want to feed those pollinators. But I'm also gonna think about the future and what my garden, I'm doing some free fall, pre-fall planning right now. So one that I'm gonna go ahead and remove, I'm removing partly because it's kind of blocking this rose here and I want that rose to have air circulation <clears throat> which will help prevent some of the spider mite that this verbena is often prone to. So I'm pulling that out. So this that is growing betwixt and between, it's insinuating itself into the branches of the rose, I'm going to remove. 
The other stuff that's on the periphery, I am not going to remove, but I am going to deadhead it and cut it back pretty far. Now this one doesn't have any sign of spider mite, which it sometimes gets. But I want it to get grow in a more bushy fashion, really thicken up. And so even though the blooms won't be here for the pollinators to enjoy right now, they will get double the pleasure. They can gorge themselves on it a little bit later in the season and in the fall. And this will put out fresh blooms. It will be bushier and it will uh, bloom exponentially. I'll get that many more blooms. So that's what I'm doing to these. And I will go around and I'll do it to all of them. And this will immediately make this look just a little bit tighter. Now, another reason I'm doing it is because these seed heads, some of them are starting to dry. And I don't want this much of it to go to seed. So by cutting it back right now, I am delaying it's going to seed. And that won't be as much of a problem. Now I could, if these blooms were a little bit fresher, I might do this and bring some in as a cut flower bouquet. But these have already started to dry. Now something else that I'm doing in this area is pulling out any stuff that is kind of dead and dried. And whatever this is, I think that was some of the, the dianthus, it's not getting enough water. So I'm just going to pull this out. And no, I will not leave all of this debris in the street. I will come back and get it a little bit later. I'm going to weed what's in here and remove some of the garden debris. Another thing that I'm going to do is I'll come back in with my other pruners and I'm going to deadhead this rose. So already you can see that just by pulling some of this dead stuff out, it's going to look a lot better. I've got some trees volunteering in here. I'll pull them out. And basically, I am just going to concentrate on this one west side, street side exposure to make it look better. I'm also going to cut back this ground cover really hard and believe me I could cut it back practically all the way and it would be just fine. The reason I'm doing this is because you can see that some of it, especially that patch over there Stuart, this has south facing exposure and some of it is really starting to show signs of distress it needs more water. Some of this is growing into the dianthus that is more, that I am, uh, that I prize more than this ground cover. So immediately you can see a little bit of a difference. Okay, can you back up Stuart? Okay. So immediately you can see a little bit of a difference that this is starting to look a little bit, um, a little bit neater and a little bit more tended. Now later when it's not so hot, boy can you hear those cicadas? Wow! When it's not so hot I'll come in and this liriope that I have edging this bed I will come in, I will dig out all of this. I hope you can hear me over that weed eater. Um, I'll dig this out and I will actually take it to my neighbors that are having difficulty growing grass in the shade. They're not big gardeners. So I am transplanting it into their yard so that they don't have a lot of areas like this, which are just, which is just exposed earth. Now, you may say, well, this isn't a very tidy ground cover to have along here on the border, but bless you, Stuart. But one of the reasons 
I've got it here. Here's another question for you guys. Does the sun make you sneeze? Yeah, okay, Stuart's saying yes, it does. And it makes me sneeze sometimes too. So, um, so I have it here because I don't want all of this wonderful dirt and everything to just wash away a road and just cause a mud path on the neighbor's driveway. So I've got it here basically to hold that soil in place and give kind of a nice fluffy border. But that doesn't mean I can just plant it and leave it alone. There will be lots of tending to it to keep it in bounds. Not a lot of times throughout the year, but periodically throughout the year. Another thing I'm doing is, and these guys, these are used to this strong south sun, so I'm just giving them a little bit of a clip. Not a lot, not nearly as tightly and not nearly as formally as I do it in the potage in the back. Just enough so that there's a little bit stronger of a globular form as I'm driving up. And I'll kind of do it to this one so it thickens up some. These are, this is, I think these are both, this one definitely is, a baby gem boxwood from the Southern Living Plant Collection. And this is also a white crepe myrtle from the Southern Living Plant Collection. I can't remember the exact cultivar right now. You know I'm terrible about that. But I will put a link um, in the description box about what variety this is. Now I'm also going to pull out this verbena from in here because we both know that crepe myrtle, even when they're in an exposed sunny area like this with good air circulation, they can still be prone to powdery mildew and spider mite this time of year. So by removing that, I'm getting better air circulation in here. And without these projecting kind of straggly stems, it looks a lot neater and a lot more tidy. And I think you can already see that. Can you see that, Stuart, from the approach? I'm going to cut down more of this verbena in here. The other thing that it does is it kind of exposes some plants I'd forgotten about underneath here. I've got some purple oxalis. I think I'm going to take that one out. And I'll do a little bit more work. I've got a mile a minute vine coming up in here. That's terrible. And a few weeds. And then any areas that are browning like this, I'm going to go ahead. And you'll notice that on these, I'm using these long-handled pruners because I feel like they are a little bit more efficient than some other tools if I just had regular pruners in here. So now I know that this aspect and this approach will be so much tidier, look a lot neater, and also give me that much valued negative space that we lose at the end of the season because everything gets so overgrown. So I am recapturing negative space. And we did a video on the importance of negative space, Stuart. I know we're sometimes bad about not remembering to put the to put the cards above that refer to something that I'm addressing. But Stuart, what time is it? We need to look at that time hack so that we remember to do that. Um, I'll come back a little bit later and be more exacting as I prune this Eugenia topiary. And as you recall, you guys, when I took these out of the greenhouse last spring, they barely had any foliage on them. They had really suffered in the greenhouse because when we had a power outage, they succumbed a bit to the cold. So they weren't as full as they normally would be. You can see here, I'm not being 
real exacting, but I definitely noticed when I drove up that the form on this Eugenia topiary was starting to be lost and it didn't have like the boxwood that I showed you momentarily or I showed you moments ago that it doesn't have that strong globular round form that I want. So again I'll come back in with some smaller pruners and get this looking even more well clipped and balanced. Sometimes when I do it with these big shears, it's not always balanced. So if you spot something I haven't clipped as I move on, I promise I'll come back and get it later. If you are as fastidious as I am. Nev, I use that word fastidious just for you because you like it. Um, so I'm going to come back in here, weed, do whatever I need to do, and in fairly quick short order, I was able to tidy this section up so that it looks a lot better from this western approach. The other thing it will do is it will give me a canvas to work on when I'm ready to overlay all my fall pretties. This bed was added, it used to stop like right up here. It curved in this direction and then it stopped. And because I couldn't grow grass down here, I extended the bed all the way down to the street so that now it almost looks like a horseshoe effect of flower beds. So that, that is this section here. Now, there's some other kind of more dramatic things I want to do. Again, I'll come back in and I'll finish deadheading this rose selectively because I'll probably want to leave some of the buds on there because I, this puts out beautiful rose hips for fall, so I'll do that rather selectively. But also by opening this up, it tells me that I defied some of my own recommendations and that is to Mo the power of three and how pleasing to the eye three things planted are or a triangle is. So one thing I noticed, one of the reasons that it looks kind of messy is because I think of this golden privet. I just think if this is a golden victory privet, I believe. And this is not one of the more cultivated varieties like Sunshine Ligustrum. This is, this is just an older variety that I planted in here to take up space when this was a brand new bed. And this area was barren. And for a while, I liked it. But now it's way too much maintenance. I have to clip it far too often. So this time of year, here's another design tip, this time of year, I find pre-fall, as you are preparing for your fall show, you're doing a lot more editing than adding and a lot more cutting back and deadheading than anything else. And some of these things, now if this were a very prized plant and I wanted to transplant it someplace else, I probably wouldn't do this now. But I kind of don't care and I will probably gift it to someone anyway. So for me, I'm gonna thank it for its service. It served me well. Now this is one of those times when I wish I didn't have on tennis shoes. Oh look, sometimes you also find beer cans <laughs> that a passerby has gifted me with. Stuart thinks that's so funny. So this may take longer than you guys want to hang in here with me, but I do want to show you what it looks like when this is removed. Because underneath this, I had hidden by the foliage of this privet is a Lady Diana Maidlin Rose, kind of a oh, ground cover rose. And I think I told you that earlier, 
I had to remove it because it had gotten rose rosette. Sorry for that noise, you guys. I'm not the only one working outside today. Let me see here. But what it did was it sent out a runner and layered itself and propagated itself without any help from me and created another bush that happily doesn't have rose rosette. So there are compensations. And by the way, the root ball of this privet is far enough away from the root ball of the rose and the other things next to it that I'm really not concerned about damaging their root ball. So this is where sometimes root force is what you need. And thankfully, I just worked out. So, I am going to remove this entire privet. Remember, don't let your plants boss you. And this plant was definitely becoming a thug. Okay, how cathartic was that, Stuart? It was for me anyway. <laughs> Maybe not for you. But now this rose will have so much more room, so much more light, and so much better air circulation that it should really thrive and it will be considerably happier. And now, in my humble opinion anyway, this is all starting to look so much nicer, so much tidier, and you can see, I think, the brilliance of the original design. There is a laggard right there that I need to take out. I said I could do this. That's more privet. So part of this is privet and part of it is the rose. And what I'm gonna do is just tend this a little bit later. And then I'll come in, and I really shouldn't do this with these. I should be disinfecting my shears in between. So do as I say, not as I do. And I think this whole area is looking considerably better. So there are, in summation, some design tips for you this time of year in late summer is it's not about what you add, it's about what you edit out. It's also about exposing and excavating the plants that are already there by giving them better, better air circulation, more room to spread out, taking out those things that aren't performing up to your well, guess what? I was about to finish this up and we literally had to stop filming because the iPhone got too hot to work anymore. It's 11 o'clock. It's supposed to get up to about 100 today and I'm sure it hasn't reached that yet. But nevertheless, obviously the heat index is pretty high. So I'm going to wrap up this very quickly because if I'm hot, you guys probably are too. And thank you for being out in the heat with me. The last thing I'm going to do on this little section is I'm going to come back in and I'm probably, there's a couple of sweet daisies that I will bring inside, but most of the daisies are spent. So I'm gonna cut these back really hard with my long handled pruners. I'm not being real exacting. I've got some more, there's some Minoan lace seeds that I'll just kind of sprinkle around. And then this area will pretty much, I think, be done. I'll come back in, I'll clean up my mess. I may go in and get a cold drink first. But this is why I typically, this time of year, 
I'm only tackling small sections at a time because not only is it hot, it can also be very, very dangerous. So I, I'll go get a drink, but actually I do have water out here. So you guys, please make sure to hydrate, work in small increments of time so you don't overdo it. Um, I have lots of layers of sunscreen on and a hat today. And then I'm gonna come back in here and just tidy up this area probably maybe later this evening, at least when it's not so sunny. Now, one other thing this tells me and another design tip is look for the obvious once you have edited out what you are editing out and what else could enhance the approach. And for me, I talked earlier about the power, the design power of three. And what this tells me is that I need another one of these white blooming crepe myrtles from Southern Living Plant Collection down there in that void. Then I will have three of those. I'm getting rid of more of the perennials and things of that nature in this bed because now the shrubs have grown to maturity. I don't need those to carry the day anymore, either for color or interest. And it will leave me enough pockets also for when I start bulb planting in the fall. And if you haven't already ordered your bulbs, that is your reminder. One last thing, um, I forgot to mention in the fashion epilogue that my sunglasses are Warby Parker and I know if I don't tell you, you will ask, so there you go. You guys go inside and get something cool to drink. Well, it's a really serious gardening day today and it's gonna be very, very hot. And I just finished my workout, which explains my fashion ensemble. So as always, if you're interested, keep watching. If you're not, skip on to the next video. So my fancy outfit today is a baseball cap that my husband brought me back from, where was it from, Stuart? Devil's River. Devil's River on one of his fishing trips. My t-shirt is actually one of my favorite t-shirts and I got this at Goodwill. I don't remember, I've had these, these shorts for forever and my tennis shoes are these, I don't even know what these are. These, are these Nikes, Stuart? Uh, I'm not sure what they are, but they're just black tennis shoes. I typically, but the point is, I seldom ever wear tennis shoes when I'm working in the garden. I practically always have on garden boots or my foot form sandals. The reason I've got these on today is because I just want to get some stuff done rather quickly and I just finished my workout. So there you go. There is my exquisite fashion ensemble for today.